So one way we can measure the strength of passwords is by looking the, at the number of attempts it would take to guess that password. So our four digit password, 10,000 possible values, so a maximum of 10,000 attempts. Our 64 bit random binary key, 2 to the power of 64 possible attempts. So we can compare them and say the one that needs more attempts is stronger. Well, what do we use entropy for? The same thing. It just converts those, the number of attempts to a smaller value by taking the logarithm. So log base 2 of 10 gives us an entropy. 10,000 attempts is equivalent to an entropy of, in our case, we got 13.28. 2 to the power of 64 attempts is equivalent to the entropy of log base 2 of 2 to the power of 64, which is 64. So entropy is just another way to compare the security of passwords. It's just on a different scale than the number of attempts. So here's three options for different password schemes. Find the strongest. A task. Three options. Find which password scheme is the strongest. So you need to calculate. The first two are easier to calculate. The third one will require a few steps. So the first option, so you're designing a system, a login system, and you're going to choose from these three options and you're going to require the user to choose a password according to one of these three options. You want to choose the strongest of the three. Option one, the user chooses a 42-bit binary value. That's their password. Option two, they choose 13 random digits, so 13 numbers. No, no more than 13, no less than 13 to keep it simple, and they're random. Option three, they choose a seven character password. Those characters are made up of upper or lowercase English, or digits, so they can choose any of those values. But there's a special rule that one of the characters must be from the punctuation characters, like slash, question mark, uh, comma, and all those. And if you look on your keyboard, you'll see there are, I think, about 32 possible punctuation characters. Compare the three and tell me which one's strongest and which one's weakest. Anyone with an answer? How are you going to compare them? Well, calculate the entropy for each. The higher the entropy, the stronger the scheme. So calculate the entropy of options one and two should be easy. You should do that in half a minute. What's the entropy of option one? 42. With a 42-bit value, option one, we have two to the power of 42 possible values. The entropy is log base two of that. Log base two of two to the power of 42 is 42. So with a binary value, the entropy is easier. It's the number of bits, and that's where the, the value, or the, that's where entropy comes from. It's the number of bits. So the, the entropy of option one is 42. What's the entropy of options two and three? And then compare them. Option two. Option two, 13 digits. Well, in fact, we were on the track there when before we said one digit has an entropy of 3.32. It's on the slide. Uh, the log base 2 of 10 is 3.32, so one digit has an entropy of 3.32. Therefore, if you take 13 digits, the entropy is just 13 times 3.32. And the answer, 13 by 3.32 was... 
Option two, entropy. 41.6. 43.16. The entropy of the first one is 42, and you think that's where entropy comes from. It's the, 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 the number of bits needed if we have a, a binary value. So the entropy of option 1 is 42. The entropy of option 2 is 13 times 3.32, which is 43.16, which is stronger than option 1. So option 2 is better than option 1. What about option three? Try and calculate that in the next few minutes. You choose seven characters. One's a punctuation character. The other six are from the, the set of English letters or numbers. And you choose randomly. And maybe to make it simpler, let's say that the, the punctuation character is just is the last character. Okay? So you choose six, six letters or numbers, and then the last one, some punctuation character. And punctuation, you don't have to remember them all, commas and all on and so on. There are 32 possible values there. What's your calculation? English. One digit is four point seven. Three digit is two six. And plus thirty two is log two of thirty two point five. Except lowercase, uppercase, or digits. We've got more to choose from. So you can't use four point seven. What'd you get? I think that's around, that looks close, that sounds correct. See if you can calculate the entropy for option three. Forty point seven sounds correct. So option one, the entropy is forty two. Option two, one digit has an entropy of three point three two. There are thirteen digits, gives us forty three point one six approximately. And then option three, what's the entropy? Some people have got it, but let, let the others try and calculate. Let's say you choose six letters or numbers at the start and then one punctuation character at the end. Option three. And you can split, you can analyze them separately. So first look at well, what's the entropy of a six letter password? And then what's the entropy of a one character password? The last punctuation character. Let's say our, let's focus first on our first six letters in, in the password. We've got six letters, and in each letter, we're choosing from how many possible values? How many possible values? Sixty-two. We have 26, 26 lowercase a to z. 
26 uppercase to choose from. That's 52 plus 10 digits. So we can choose from 62 possible values, 62 characters. So if we just choose one value out of those 62, the entropy is log base 2 of that. I'll just write log. So whatever the log of 62 is, the log of 60 log of 62 is because we can choose there are 62 possible values the entropy of one character from that set is log of 62 which is 5.95 approximately close to 6 and since we have six letters or six uh, yeah six characters in our password with that entropy then it, we multiply by 6 but then at the end we add one more character some punctuation character and there are 32 possible values so the entropy of that one character is log of 32 which is 5 6 times 5.94 5.95 times plus 5 is about 40.7 log base 2 yes where I've written log here log base 2 So we break it into two, two, two parts. The first six characters, where we choose from 62 possible values for each character, and the last one character, one times, where we choose from 32 possible punctuation characters. And it becomes six times, about 36 plus five, almost 41. Which one's strongest? Which one is strongest? Option, hands up for one, hands up for two, hands up for three. Okay, the highest one. The larger the entropy, the stronger that password will be. So that's what we can use entropy for, to compare the strength of different password schemes. But the problem in practice is that this assumes the user chooses a random password. The first one is a random 42-bit key, 13 random digits, and this one, six random letters or numbers, and then one random punctuation character. Think of all your passwords. How many of them are truly random? Most people do not choose random numbers or random values. They choose something that has some meaning. Any questions on how to calculate entropy at the moment? We'll, we'll return in a minute. We'll give some different examples. So because most human created passwords are not random, it's hard to actually estimate what the, the entropy of a, a particular password will be. NIST is a, a organization in the US that creates standards. They've done some research and some studies and come up with some approximations of the entropy of different passwords that users may choose. And some of the results are uh, shown in this table. Let's explain it and then compare some values. In the right hand column, or the right hand two columns, uh, what we know is when we, the user randomly chooses a password, like what we just cal calculated. In the first column is the length of the password, the number of characters. The last column is if the user chooses from the printable ASCII characters. What are the printable ASCII characters? What do we have in that previous option three? We had 26 lowercase letters, 26 uppercase, 10 digits, that's 62 plus the 32 punctuation characters, slash, question mark, and so on, that's 94 printable characters. So if the user can choose randomly from those 94 printable characters, and they choose a password with 10 characters, then the entropy, if we follow through, is 65.9. Okay, so that's how we read that. If we're using 94 character alphabet, 
and we choose a password length of 10 characters, and if it's randomly chosen, that's the last two columns, the entropy would be 65.9. If we chose just from the digits, the 10 digits, so this is a 10 character alphabet, and it was 10 digits long, then the entropy will be 33.3, 30 .3, which is 10 times 3.32, which we calculated before. So that's what the last two columns are for. But the user normally doesn't choose a random password. They have some structure in the password. So what NIST did is they used some, some basic techniques to try and work out, OK, say you choose a password from letters, normally even though you've got 94 characters to choose from, normally a user will use lowercase characters. Sometimes they'll use uppercase, but their, their assumption that most times they'll use a low, lowercase character. And let's say the first letter you choose is the letter T in your password. Then the next letter will normally be limited from the set of 94 characters. That is, you normally not choose a password which is T followed by Z or T followed by Q. You may choose T followed by E or T followed by O. So the relationship between the letters will depend upon the frequencies of characters in a particular language normally. So they've done some analysis. It's not very... Uh, it's not 100% accurate, but just to give an idea, and said that if a user could choose from 94 characters under some assumptions, if there were no checks on what the user chose, then they calculate the entropy if we choose 10 character password to be 21. Much lower than if we choose randomly of 65 because a user, usual, a user will usually choose according to some structure. <coughs> they will not choose randomly. So they, you cannot choose from 94 possible characters for each letter in your, in your password. If you want to see the exact assumptions I've made, the, the document describes them. It, it goes through in detail. And in fact, it's based upon a study done by Shannon. Everybody remembers Shannon? Shannon capacity in data communications. Shannon confusion, diffusion in uh, DES and block ciphers. Shannon also did work related to the entropy and the entropy of passwords. No checks means that the user chooses under some assumptions. The next column, dictionary rule, means that if the user chooses a password, the system then compares and makes sure that that word is not in a dictionary. So you have a dictionary of English words, and if it's in the dictionary, then it cannot be counted. They have to choose a different password. So that limits in this case. And that, in fact, adds to the strength. And I've done some uh, calculations and see, OK, if you don't choose a dictionary word, the entropy goes up, in this case, to 26 if it's 10 characters. And the last column, or this column here, is if you choose and you limit from dictionary words and you have some additional rules on how you must create the password. For example, you must have one punctuation character, you must have one uppercase, at least one uppercase, it must have one, at least one lowercase. Rules like that, how to compose the password. I'm sure you may have seen them when you create passwords for different websites. The website will restrict or require your password to have some particular characters. Which makes the password stronger. And they've done some calculations and see, OK, the entropy goes up to 32. Now, it's not not entirely representative of all password schemes, but it gives an idea. When the user chooses, it's nowhere near as strong as randomly chosen, because the user chooses based upon some structure in most cases. Okay? A user can choose a random password, but most people do not. So, for example, if we want to get equivalent to 
or at least an entropy of 64, equivalent to a 64-bit key, if we randomly choose from 94 characters, we need 10 characters. If we randomly choose from 10 digits, uh, sorry, from digits, we need 20, a 20 character password. Our password must be 20 digits. So from the printable characters, I need either a 10 letter password or from the numbers, I need a 20 number password for the, about the same strength. If I have no checks, then in fact it doesn't even go up to 64. We need more than 40 letters in our password to get the same strength. Who has a 40 letter password? Anyone? So none of, no one has the same strength password as a 64 bit key. That's the point here. Most people have passwords in this range in length. Less than 10 characters in, in most cases. Some may be longer. But think about your passwords and the length of them usually in this range. And the entropy is therefore usually in the order of 10, 20, maybe up to 30, depending upon your password scheme. So your password may be about the same strength as a 10-bit key or a 20-bit key, meaning it takes a few uh, millions of attempts to break, which is not many. And some, some systems limit the length of the password. So some, uh, especially financial organizations, will limit to, say, six characters. So different systems have different schemes. So we can use the entropy to compare against them. But there's no one way to say which scheme is best because we need to consider not just the strength but also the usability. And of course, the, this is under some simple assumptions about the user, what a human user would choose. But in fact, different people may choose passwords differently. So some may choose random, some may choose a simple word, some may com combine different characters in different ways. So how do you choose a good password? Any suggestions? Don't tell me your password, but give me a suggestion for how to choose a good password. Don't tell me choose 64 random binary bits, because I never remember that. Can anyone suggest how to choose a good password? Again. How do you choose a password? A good password. What do you do? Mix between alphabet and digits. Mix between alphabet and digits randomly. Okay, not so good. Because if it's not random, if it follows some structure, then that's equivalent to these. Any, any more, more precise suggestions? There are different ways. So, for example, type, because on your keyboard you have Thai, Thai characters and English characters, so type, hit the Thai keys, and the password comes out as English letters. Okay? Okay, until someone knows that scheme, and then they just need to map the English letters back to the Thai uh, or the, the Thai letters to the English keys. But yeah, there's one way in that uh, if someone's looking just at the uh, that English set of letters that you've created, it would look random or, or almost random in that case. Using a different language doesn't really help because the attacker just needs to, uh, once it knows the language, 
It just needs to attack based upon that language. If they don't know the language, then try multiple languages. There's not so many. Okay. So, but using uh, translations or similar to the this scheme of the uh, the keyboard mixes up the letters. Any other schemes? Keywords from hobbies or from things that you know about or you, you are interested in? Keywords. Uh, like one word? Would that word be in a dictionary? Dictionary words are some of the least secure passwords in that what an attacker will usually first do, instead of randomly try passwords, they'll take a dictionary. Now a dictionary is something that includes a large set of words, known words. Uh, and they'll just try those dictionary words. And most people do choose a word from a dictionary. Now, how big is a dictionary? If we choose, say, the Oxford English Dictionary, there's maybe 200,000 words. Not many. They just have to try 200,000 words. And a computer can try that many, we'll see later in an offline guess, very fast. But of course there are different combinations and there's different specialist words so that can expand but if a word or your password is from a dictionary generally that's one of the easier passwords to break. Phrases, assuming there's no limit on the length, what limits the length usually your ability to remember. Okay? So but if it's a phrase uh, something, a line from a song or, or something that you know and remember easily, then that is slightly better because now it's a combination of words from a dictionary. Or even better, choose four words from the dictionary randomly and just use them. You'll usually, after using it several times, remember those four words you just need to remember the order of them and it makes it long enough and usually gives a large enough entropy to be uh, secure against most attacks. There are many different ways. Okay? Um, we're not going to go through all the different ways. You should investigate and think about, now that you know how to compare different schemes, think about which ones are more secure. And especially which ones are not secure and don't use the insecure approaches. So you don't have to read online, you can even just think about your schemes on your own and do your own analysis to see what's secure. We, were, we started on online password guessing where the attacker goes to the computer system and tries the passwords while it's in use. What's offline password guessing? The system stores some information about the passwords. We'll see shortly an example of how. But the system must store something, something about the password. Offline password guessing is when the attacker can get access to that information. For example, if there's a file that stores the set of passwords, then if the attacker can get that file and then try to discover your password. Usually there's fewer restrictions on the time that the attacker has available in this case. Because if you can, or another way, let's say you go up to my office and take a copy of the hard drive. Then you have all the time in the world. You can go home, you can try many different computers to try and find my password because you don't have to worry about me coming back to my office. So that will be an offline attack. because you're not trying to break the password while using the system. So if we can do that, we have less restrictions on time. The guesses are not recorded in this case, so I cannot log how many guesses you're making because you're doing it on your own computer. So in that case, what do we do? Well, we must make sure that the passwords which are stored on the system are secure. Even if you can copy my hard disk, it should be practically impossible to find my password. And we use cryptographic techniques to do that. 
and the most common or the, the most recommended approach is in fact you do not store the password, you store a hash of the password on the system. And also, all right, it doesn't protect against copying of files, but give limited access to, in terms of permissions to the files that store the passwords. So, so that not anyone who accesses the computer system can read that file, especially if it's a shared computer system. So let's look how, how Linux does it in terms of storing a, a password and see how storing a hash helps. We'll explain briefly here and then show on, the, on, on my computer. How do we store passwords in Linux or Unix-like operating systems, as an example? There's two files stored. So on my laptop, we'll see shortly, there are two main files. In the directory etc, there's a file called passwd, the password file. In fact, it doesn't store the passwords nowadays. In the past, in the old times, it did store the part or some hash of the passwords. Now it's used to store the user information. For example, your username. And so that stores just a text file and each line contains information about each user. I'll show you an example shortly. So a username and some other information, like the name of the user. And then there's a second file called the shadow file. And that stores, again, the username as well as a hash of that user's password. In terms of permissions, normally the passwd file is world readable. That is, anyone who has an account on the computer system can read that file. So anyone can see the list of usernames, but the shadow file is normally readable just by admin. So the administrator, the root user of the system. For example, the IT server. All of you have accounts on the IT server. All of you can read the passwd file and see the set of users on that computer system. But none of you, only I, can read the shadow file. The shadow file contains the hash of the passwords of all the users. Let's have a look as an example. On my system, currently I just have, on my laptop, I just have myself as a user. Let's add a user, just briefly. Uh, add user and let me remember how to do it. Just for this example, Normally when we add a user, they have a home directory on, on the computer. I don't want to create a home directory for this user. So no create home. And the username, so I choose a username. Uh, anyone? Volunteer? We had some volunteers last week. Anyone else? Hmm? S-A-N. Okay, so add a user. I'm the admin, so I need to uh, give my own password. I've typed it wrong. So it adds, a, adds this user to my computer system. Now this is where we register the password. So the user would choose their password. I would choose it for them. I typed it in there. It doesn't show what I'm typing in, so that someone can't see what I'm typing. I, the password I chose was just the word password. It lets me choose some full information. Okay. So I just registered a new user on my computer system. Where is that information stored? Let's look. There's the first the passwd file in the etc directory. Grep just searches through that text file looking for this word, Sandy and it's going to show this line. There's one line inside this file which contains this. 
and it's, it's just a text file and it's separated, each field is separated by a colon here. So here's the username. The next field, x, means the password is not stored in this file, it's in the shadow file, in another file. This is a user ID. In, in Unix, a user has a username and a, a number as an ID. And in fact, a group, a group ID. This is, I didn't enter a full name or a room number, that would be stored here if I did enter it, between the, the commas here. Their home directory, even though it wasn't created, and the shell, the terminal, when they log in, what program runs, bash in this case. But importantly, this file stores the set of users. In fact, I'll show the entire file. Okay, there are many users created automatically. You see me here, so my username, user ID 600, my name, there's no other information home. The rest are really just for specific services on, on my computer, on Linux. So most of them are servers. They're, they're not individual human users. Uh, they are special cases, not important. So the, the past WD file stores the user information. And now let's look at the shadow file. So I, I tried to search in the shadow file for the word Sandy using the program grep and it says permission denied. Normally you cannot read that file because it's considered more secure than the others. So there are permissions set up that a normal user cannot read the file. You need to be root or admin. So I will use sudo to do that. And here's the, the password information. Let's see the structure. Here's the username, and then the next field starts here, this $6, and goes through to here. This field is a, a hash of the password, and also the algorithm used to hash the password. The remaining fields are about how, uh, how long the password is valid for. You can put time limits on the password so that the user has to change their password every day, every month. So that's what these fields are for, to store information about this password must, will expire in one hour. So we don't care too much about these values. Focus on from $6 through to this TP slash. Sorry, wrong button. Again. Try and zoom in a bit. Unfortunately, it's quite long, so it wraps around, but this field after the username and goes through to here is a hash of the password and the algorithm used. So, and, and another value we'll see shortly. The dollar signs separate the subfields here. So in fact, inside here, there's a, a field with a value 6, another field with a value O, W, Z, through to PG, and then from the here, number 0, 1, U, all through to L, T, P, slash, that is a hash of the password. The second field is a salt, and we'll come back to explain that. The first field is the algorithm used to perform the hash. Algorithm number six, what algorithm was that? We have to look up some man page to see that. I have to scroll, quickly scroll down and find the algorithm in one of our 
help pages, it says algorithm number six is SHA-512. So we're using the hash algorithm SHA and the output value is 512 bits long. So SHA-512 produces a 512 bit hash value. So the format is shown here and it's not encrypted, so even though it says encrypted here, it's the actual hash value. The algorithm, the salt, and the hash value. How do we use a hash value? Well, a Y. This is where the, the system stores information about the user's password. So now when the user tries to log in, So here's, our, here's my laptop. When the user comes along and wants to log in, inside here is our file which, which stores the hash. It stores the username. Sandy. It stores the algorithm, number six, which is SHA-512. This salt, which we'll come back to, and the hash value, this long value. Let's say H1, the hash value for even better, H Sandy. That's the stored value. Where H Sandy is the hash using SHA 512 of the password they chose. And I actually created chose the word password. Now, when they log in, the user submits to the system their username. So when they log in, they type their username, press enter, and then they type their password. So they submit their username and their password. And it's password. The system doesn't store the actual password, it just stores the hash of the password. So what happens when the user submits their username and password, the login system takes a hash, hash of the received or submitted value, take a hash of the submitted value and compares it against the hash value stored. And our properties of hash functions mean that in practice if the two passwords are the same, that is the one that was created at the start and then stored in the hash value here, which is in the file on the screen, if the hash value is the same as the the hash of the submitted password, it means the passwords are the same. That's our, our practical property of hash functions. The hash of two messages which are the same will produce the same hash value. If the password submitted is wrong, it's ABC, then the hash of the submitted password will not match the hash value stored. Of course the usernames must match as well. So in fact, we don't store the password, we store a hash of the password. And it still allows us to authenticate the user because the hash of the submitted password must match the hash of the stored password. If they do, it implies that the two passwords are the same. Why do we not store the password? Why do we store the hash? As several people have said, so that the attacker cannot see the password. Okay? If, if we stored the password, and if someone could get access to this file, either through other malicious means or uh, someone who has permissions to read it, but shouldn't get the password, then if we don't store the hash but store the actual password, 
then I've discovered automatically another user's password. Now consider, consider for example, the IT server. On the IT server, you all have accounts. You all have your passwords created. You set your own password. I'm the admin. If we did not use a hash, then I could see all of your passwords. And most likely, some of you use your passwords for the IT server the same as other systems. So people could discover and find your passwords. By storing the hash value, how do I get your password? Another property of the hash function is that we cannot go backwards, the one-way property. Given the hash value, it's practically impossible for me to work out what the original password was. Okay? So that's why the hash function is useful here in password storage. The, we can still authenticate the user because the user submits a password, we take a hash of that password and compare it against the hash value. If the two passwords were the same, then the hash values will be the same. If the two passwords are different, then the hash values will be different. And someone who gets access to this file cannot easily find the password of the user. They just find the hash of that password. So that's common in most operating systems. So Windows does it as well. They just may use different files, a different way to store it, and possibly a different hash algorithm, but the same concept. Any questions on how the password is stored? And th this is not just for operating systems. Most login systems can or, or do or should use this approach. When you register for a website, okay, Hotmail, Gmail, or any website where you need a username and password, if that website has been built securely, what happens is that when you register, your username and the hash of your password is stored in some database. So the password's not stored in a database, a hash of the password is stored. And when you log into that website, you supply your username and password, and the system calculates a hash of your password and compares it against the database. So same approach. Of course, some websites don't do that, and you look over the news over the last year or two, there are many cases where if a website doesn't do that, and someone maliciously gains access to the database, they can find the passwords of many users. So if we didn't store as a hash, but store the actual password, and there have been attacks against website where the attacker finds the password of thousands of users and releases it on the internet, and therefore they can log into different accounts. It's more complex than that. We said we take a hash of the password, that provides a level of security. In fact, in practice, normally we introduce another value as well, the salt. But before we try and explain the salt, let's do some simple calculations of uh, how an attacker could try to perform an offline attack on such a, a password database. So think of this file, this shadow file, as a database of usernames and passwords. Similarly, if you're using MySQL to store it for a website, then you have some database of usernames and passwords but not the actual password, a hash of the password. Now assume an attacker has this file, or has the database, what can they do to find the password? How will you find the password of the users? Here you have a hash value of one user, how do you find the password? Come on, I know some of you have strong minds and uh, uh, not malicious, but sometimes think maliciously, what would you do? How would you find the user's password? I've given you the hash value. You can see it on the screen. Find their password. 
tell me how you do it. So given, forget about salt for a moment, but given this hash value, a 512-bit value, it's not stored in binary here, it's converted to some, uh, it's encoded in some ASCII or base64 encoding, but it's a 512-bit value. Given that, find the user's password. What do you do? Random, random hash what? So take random passwords, calculate the hash, and compare against the given hash. And once you get a match, yeah, once you get a match, you've found the password. Let's try that. So as the attacker, you know the hash value. And you want to find the password. So you basically, you can do a brute force attack. Choose some password, P1. Calculate the hash of P1. And let's say you get lowercase h1. Does h1 match h sandy? If yes, then we've found the password. It's P1. If no, try P2. Take the hash. Get H2. Does H2 mate match H Sandy? If so, we've found the password. If not, keep trying. Okay. So that's a brute force attack. What do you try as passwords? What value are you going to try first? P1. What value? A dictionary word. Okay, so most likely the user chose a password from a dictionary. So don't try random passwords. So we want to get to the password as fast as possible. If we try random passwords, then it depends upon the length and we can calculate how many attempts we'd need to find it. But most likely the password is not a random string, but it's from a, a dictionary or some modification of a dictionary word. So try dictionary words. Take a dictionary, 200,000 different words in English, try some variations on those words, and try them first. And you're much more likely to find the hash value. So not just dictionary words, but different combinations of, of words and, and different strings, birth dates, information about people, and so on. So that's a normal approach. How many attempts or how fast will it take to find, find the password? Let's introduce some numbers and give some examples of what effort it would take. Let's assume that we can calculate hashes at a speed of 1 by 10 to the 8 hashes per second. That is, calculating a hash takes some time. Because the, the function is quite complex, like encrypting something, it takes some time. And your computer, let's say this is 100 million hashes per second which is quite fast for normal computers. Maybe using a GPU, uh, a, a recent G GPU, you could get to that speed. Okay? Because a GPU can do things in parallel quite well. But, so this is taken from some typical computer that I looked up and saw that they could do about 100 million hashes per second using SHA-512. So then the question is, well, how many attempts do we have to make until we find the password and how long will it take? Well it depends upon the length of the password because how many possible passwords are there? Let's say the password let's say the password was a dictionary word first Let's 
The password was chosen from an English dictionary. How many words in an English dictionary? About 200,000. How long to find the password? Less than a second. Okay. We can do 100 million hashes per second. We only need to try 200,000 and we find it. Assuming the password was taken directly from some dictionary. Because in uh, an English dictionary there are about 200,000 unique words. It, it varies uh, under different conditions. So if it was a word from a dictionary, easy to find the password. That's why choosing a word from a dictionary to choose for your password is not a good idea. Let's say we have a six character password instead. The user was a bit smarter and they didn't choose from a dictionary, they chose a six character password and from the printable characters from your keyboard. So 94 possible characters. How many possible passwords are there? So each character can be from one, can, is chosen one from 94 possible values. So there are six characters, so 94 to the power of six. And I've calculated before, it's about 6.9 by 10 to the power of 11. So they randomly chose a password, six characters long, and each character was chosen from one of the printable keys from your keyboard, so from one of 94 characters. Gives us about 7 by 10 to the power of 11 possible passwords. Now what I do as an attacker is using my computer I'm trying 100 million hashes per second. 100 million passwords per second and comparing. How long does it take? Well, 6.9 by 10 to the power of 11 divided by 10 to the power of 8, which is 6.9 by 10 to the power of 3, which is 6,900 seconds. What is it in 6,900 seconds? Do I have the answer? In hours? 6,900 seconds. 3,600 is one hour, so it's about two hours. About. Okay. So it takes two hours to find this password. Not, not long. Okay, that's good. If it takes me two hours to find the password, then that's considered uh, easy for the attacker. Using one computer, two hours to find a password is not very secure. So, that's why we need to A, make sure our passwords are strong, but we know if we make the password longer, it becomes more inconvenient for the user. Let's try what if we had eight characters? So the user chose not six characters, but eight. Then it's 94 to the power of eight, which, and I calculated before, is six by 10 to the power of 15. That's how many possible passwords if we have an eight character password. And so now it's six by 10 to the power of 15 divided by 10 to the power of eight, which is six by 10 to the power of seven seconds. Takes the attacker 705 days to find the password. So that's more secure. By adding two more random characters, you've gone from a two hour attack to a two year attack, okay? So this is an eight character password is not, not too long, although this is random. Not many people remember or choose random passwords.
and, and of course, they usually choose a word from a particular language or a dictionary or, or related. So under the assumption of random eight characters, 705 days. So not, not so good for the attacker now. But what if the attacker was a student here at the university and they used the lab computers to do an attack? This is using one computer that does 100 million hashes per second. 100 million passwords per second they try. What if they put the software running on the, the lab computers and leave it running over multiple days? And let's say we have 100 different lab computers all trying to break the password and because we just try the passwords in parallel, that is some of the passwords we try on one computer, another set on another computer, and so on. So we can do the test of the passwords in parallel across 100 different computers. Say there's 100 different computers in the labs. Cutting the time by a factor of 100. From 705 days down to 7 days. Okay, Just by expanding the computer resources in this case, not too hard. All right, maybe not achievable in here, but in some organizations may be possible quite easily for a user to get access to 100 computers, run for seven days this software that tries to calculate the hashes of passwords. Seven days and they find the user's password. A new user comes along. We create a new user on the account. Volunteers? Doesn't matter. We create a new user. And let's look at the hash value. So I created a new user, John. And the hash value is here. There's a completely different hash value if we compare to Sandy. So two different hash values. So now the attacker wants to find a password spend another seven days trying to find the password. Okay? So, to find John's password. But they don't have to. Instead, when we found the search for the first password, store these values. Store them in some database. So that now when we have John's hash value, this new hash value, Instead of recalculating the hashes of all the different passwords, we've stored the password and the hash value in some database and simply look up the hash value. And generally a lookup is much faster than a hash. Calcul calculating the hash of some value takes some time, but looking up some entry in a database is usually orders of magnitude much faster because calculating hash like a cryptographic operation uh, involves many steps. A lookup is just a comparison between a hash value and a known hash value. So what the attacker does, the first time they, they try all possible passwords, our 6 by 10 to the 15 passwords, hash each of them, and it takes seven days. They did it across their 100 computers on the lab, and they get all the hash values. They store them in a database. So a large table which has password, and hash value. P1, 
H1, P2, H2. P, and they have 6 by 10 to the power of 15. All possible passwords, they've already calculated. It took them seven days to do it, but they've calculated all possible hash values from those passwords. Now, John's password, how do they find it? They take the hash value and simply look in this database here. They look for the corresponding hash value here. It should be there because John's password, assuming it's the same length, it's eight, rent, it's eight characters, will be there. So performing a lookup, and once they find the hash value, then they've found John's password. And in fact, they can do it for all users now by just looking up in this table. That's much faster than calculating the hash again, because performing a lookup, that is comparing the hash with a value in a table, is very fast comparing to calculating a hash. Depends upon the speed of the computer. We said we could calculate hashes at 10 to the power of 8 hashes per second. Let's assume we can do lookups at and I've just made this number up to get uh, some nice results. But much faster, and let's make it 10 to the power of 12 per second. What that means, I have some database on my computer as the attacker, and what I do is just compare two values in one row. And let's say I can do 10 to the power of 12 comparisons per second with my computer. It should be much faster than calculating a hash because hash are uh, relatively slow. So how long does it take me to find John's password? I've got 6 by 10 to the power of 15 hash values. I look up at a rate of 10 to the power of 2 per second, so it's 6 by 10 to the power of 3. seconds. 6,000 seconds, which is also our two hours. It's in fact one hour, 40 minutes. So now what the attacker can do, once I've calculated this table of passwords and hash values, for any user, they just find that user's hash value and look up in this table and they immediately or very quickly find the corresponding password. Because performing a lookup of a table it can be quite fast. So it takes, in this case with our example, less than two hours to find John's password. Any new user, take two hours or slightly less. So, this is common in what malicious users do is that they calculate the hash values of many different possible passwords, store them in a table, and then sell the tables. Sell the table to someone who's trying to find someone's password. Okay? Because assuming someone has already calculated the table, it may have taken them seven days, it may have taken them one year. But once they have the table, it can be reused. And because of lookups are very fast, it can be reused and you can very quickly find the corresponding password. How big is the table? How big is this table? How many, alright, let's calculate. There are 6 by 10 to the power of 15 entries. Okay. Each entry has a password and a hash value. The hash value is, what do we say, 512 bits. So multiply by, we have 512 bits. And the password, how big is the password? Eight bytes. It's eight characters in this case. 64 bits.
Have I calculated before? I think I have the answer. It's about, I've calculated for a different value. 640,000 terabytes. Okay, there's our problem. Okay, to store those 6 by 10 to the power of 15 possible values, no, assuming no compression or, or just store them in a raw form, we need 640,000 terabytes. Okay, we cannot do that. Even though we may be able to find 100 lab computers, I cannot find 640,000 hard drives to store it on. But it turns out that there are efficient ways, efficient data structures to store such information. You can store the hashes and the passwords in a very efficient manner. Effectively compresses it down. And the data structures are referred to as rainbow tables. We're not going to cover how they work, but there are some ways to, instead of storing that 640,000 terabytes, using some different data structures you can effectively compress it to be much smaller. And different approaches, let's say, and I'll show you examples shortly, because I got the numbers from examples. What is it? Uh, about three terabytes out of space. With rainbow tables, instead of requiring 640,000 terabytes, you can actually reduce the size required to store all of this information to around several terabytes. I do have three terabytes of hard drives, very cheap. So this is what attackers do. They spend a lot of time to calculate the hash values of many passwords and then use some efficient data structures, rainbow tables are very common, to store that information. And then when you want to find a password, given a hash value, perform a lookup. And lookups are very fast compared to ca calculating a hash. So if you have the table, a lookup, okay, depending upon the size, can be the order of hours. Less if for a smaller table, more for a larger table. And, and the speed of the computer. And the storage, using these efficient data structures, can be manageable. Three terabytes, no problem. 640,000 terabytes, not possible. Let's finish with a, a final example. And people who have calculated these hash values store them and some people sell them. So this CryptoHaze actually has software for calculating the hashes and they, you can purchase the tables that they've already calculated. $500. Using different algorithms, NTLM is an old one used in Windows, MD5 is an old one used in some Unix systems, now they use SHA-5112. So you can buy, they'll send you hard disks including the hash, hash tables, $500. And then you don't have to spend the seven days or the, seven, or the 700 days to calculate the hash tables, they're already calculated for you. You can quickly do a lookup from that hash table. So they've already done the time consuming part and they use rainbow tables to store that information in some efficient form. And another one, so they have different sets of rainbow tables, again different hash algorithms, NTLM, MD5, SHA-1, and different character sets. So we did it for eight characters, but some passwords will be two, three, four, five, six characters. 
So they have different combinations. And they talk about the key space, how, how many keys or how many passwords in each table. And somewhere they have a price. Why? Yes, I'd say it's legal. It's just calculating hashes of passwords. <laughs> Using it to access a system may be illegal, but calculating the values is, uh, I doubt if it's illegal. So, depending upon the size, up to 1,250 US dollars to get that table. Of course, it's legal to calculate the hash values. There's nothing wrong with calculating hash values of passwords. But as with everything we teach, using this information to do malicious things can be illegal. Finding someone's password and then using it to access their bank account, their Hotmail, their Moodle login would be illegal. NTLM is a hash algorithm used by Windows, or at least old Windows. Windows XP, I think, is the latest version. No, different algorithm. There's MD5 tables and SHA-1 tables. SHA-5112, because it's much longer, it's not, this approach is not so useful because we've got more to store, so it's not so common. So, how do we stop someone from doing this? So given someone can do this and store it in a reasonable space and therefore make it easy to find the password, we'll see that we introduce a new value, a salt. When you hash the password, you don't just hash the password, you hash the password plus the salt. The salt effectively increases the length and increases the size. We'll see, for example, and we'll do it next week, a 12-bit salt increases this from 3 terabytes up to a factor of 4,000, so 12,000 terabytes, which is, again, not manageable. So next week we'll go through how we use a salt to avoid such attacks.